remember, I'm sure, because you were the president of the uh, University yeah. of Paris Dauphine. Now, uh, uh, I have the pleasure to see you here, have the pleasure to see you here and uh, do this introduction. It was not very easy. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, Ivo Eklund, uh, um, his scientific work has numerous ramifications of great significance in the areas of functional analysis, calculus of variations, Hamiltonian systems, economics, optimization, and dynamical systems. I am sure that uh, many of uh, of you that are here have uh, had uh, contact with uh, the work of uh, Ivar Eklund. Um, he has published several books in pleasant and accessible style to non expert in mathematics, explaining parts of chaos theory, fractals, and probability. To mention three, there are many. I'll mention just three. The cat in Numberland, the broken dice and other mathematical tales of chance, the best possible word. I have seen some of them and I recommend it strongly. <laughs> of course, he also has written relevant books for mathematicians such as Convex Analysis and Variational Problems. Applied Nonlinear Analysis, Convex Methods in Hamiltonian Mechanics, Exterior Differential Calculus and Applications to Economics. Finally, finally, I cannot resist mentioning the Ekeland Variational Principle. Thank you. A valuable principle introduced by Ekeland in 1972 and with far-reaching applications in the calculus of variations. Um, in my opinion, I find it one of the more of those mathematical jewels uh, will continue to show its value in years to come. And in particular for me, it has been of great importance in my research. Thanks, Zivar. Thank you very much, Giles. <laughs> uh, so today we have the pleasure of hearing uh, Ivar to speak uh, and uh, the title will be, uh, where is the title? It's over here. Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> Ah, okay, very good, very good. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> my, I am sorry, I'm sorry, my German is not good. Well, okay, so here, thank is, you, here is Eva. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Well, this was the best part of the talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> it can only go down. So let me translate the title, An Jugendtraum. It's uh, famous in mathematics. It means dream of the youth, the dream you have when you're young. And Kronecker had a Jugendtraum. Kronecker Jugendtraum was an algebraic program in algebra which was fulfilled and so on. It was his dream as a youth. And I have also, I have a Jugendtraum, things I wished to achieve when I was young, and I'm going to show them to you. So what is my Jugendtraum? And you see, it's nice getting old and being retired because now I can work on the Jugendtraum. You see? This is why it is so nice. So now I work on my Jugendtraum, and let me start with something. Let me start with a letter from Arnold. So 
now I go here and uh, here and uh, I have to put visualizer uh, poof 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 uh, how do you do it? Control L. Yeah, it's Control L. So here you have a letter by Arnold. Now Arnold, you cannot see very well, but this letter dates from 1965. In 1965, that is 52 years ago, Arnold had just written this wonderful paper with Kolmogorov on the KEM, and uh, many people thought <coughs> they'd prove the stability of the solar system. And Arnold, in 1965, living in Paris, you cannot see, but it's Maison de Norvège, he's living at the Cité Universitaire, he has written his paper, and he writes to Monsieur Enon, which is well known now in dynamical systems, you know the Enon attractor, and uh, Enon was an astronomer in Nice, Monsieur Enon, Institut d'Astrophysique, and he writes to Monsieur Enon, Institut d'Astrophysique, explaining to him his result and suggesting some numerical methods. So in this letter, Arnold has proven KM theory and wants some numerics. And Enon is supposed to do the numerics. And you know, now, I'm getting old and so on, I wish for those times because this letter stays. Of course, now the internet, he would have sent an email and no one <laughs> have, and I would, 50 years later, no one had been able to show the letter. But now we have this letter. And you see, he goes on, he explains his work, canonical transformation, you can see very well, but here you have the lemma. Now you can see dimly, he explains things, and you can begin to see things you see this kind of picture? People in dynamical systems know this kind of picture, right? You see them. They come from the pendulum and so on. All the pictures you see in dynamical systems appear here. This also should be familiar to you. He continues, you have all this. And here, you see we're at IMPA. So anyone at IMPA would recognize this equation. It is the homological, what Arnold called the homological equation that is fundamental for KAM. That is a way you prove that rotations of the, uh, that, uh, no, that uh, diffeomorphism of the circle, which, has, which have a certain rotation number, is, uh, isomorphic to rotation. This is a very fundamental equation in dynamical system. Hermann worked on this and so on, blah, blah. Uh, it goes on and on. He explains things. Here, you see, recognize this picture again. So it's really a compendium of dynamical systems. And here, you recognize this, of course. This is not the cat yet, but it is hyperbolic maps, right? Contract in one direction, chaos theories, all there. And it concludes by saying, voici quelques prévisions théoriques pour le cas. Uh, for the cas theoric. And here you have this note I'm reading to you. Ce ne doit pas être très difficile de programmer les calculs de ces trois limites. It should not be very difficult to do the computations for these three cases. And then you have on the back of the last letter a remark by Eno. Now you see Eno. Remarks on Arnold. From Arnold's paper, you have, and so on and so on. Now, and he's going to low a quantity m. What is this quantity m? Arnold's paper deals with the restricted three-body problem. You have the sun, which has mass one. You have a big planet, Jupiter, going around. And then you have a third planet with mass m on a orbit inside. And uh, Arnold's paper de deal with Condition saying that M will basically, this planet will basically stay on the Keplerian orbit. And Eno looks into Arnold's paper and sees how large M has to be. And Eno concludes from Arnold's inequalities, M has to be less than 10 to the power minus 320. Bear in mind that the ratio of mass from the universe 
to a quark is 10 to the minus 100. And Enon concludes there is no point in doing any computation. This is very far from having any practical application at all. So it's a very interesting theorem, and it raises the standard question. Is such a theorem true or not? No? Has certainly no relevance in the physical world. Now you may say, of course, but now we have the computers and all this. True enough. So what's the present situation? First of all, you, we are dealing with problem stability, blah, blah. Now, very recently at Dauphine, someone named Thibaut Castor has made a thesis where he has revisited all the proofs, not Arnold's proof, but the best proofs available, and uh, has computed uh, the situations where now you have to compare the mass of Jupiter to the mass of their planet, and he finds not 10 to the minus 33, but 10 to the minus 85. In other words, the bounds are bad. They're bound, they're not bad. They are high allosy. Nice to see you. <laughs> An old friend from economics. Uh, the, the, the bounds are not bad. They are terrible. In other words, to say, mathematicians are ridiculous. <laughs> that is true. And if you look at the physical literature, they find invariant tori, right and left, and so on. And we come with 10 to the minus 100. And my Jürgen Traum would be, so it's a general problem. And the Jürgen Traum is try to bring, to make perturbation theory relevant. Can one improve these results and make a connection between what mathematics up there and what's really happening down there? So that's the Jugendhau. OK. And now, so this has been inspiring my work for the past years. And let me begin with some success. Let me begin with the three cases first. So I'll show you. So the problem is perturbation theory. Perturbation theory is when you have a situation and you have a small perturbation. So it's basically when you use the inverse function theorem. And my claim is it has to do with the inverse function theorem. And then can we improve the inverse function theorem? Answer, yes. So let me present a new inverse function theorem. Here, just. So we agree, a technical thing, if you wish. You have two Banach space x and y. What do I call a differentiable function? Well, usually you, you say f is gato differentiable if its restriction to any straight line is differentiable. In finite dimension, that would basically mean that partial derivatives exist. It is Adamar differentiable. If it is differentiable along its restriction to any curve, it's differentiable. And it is C1. If it is differentiable in any sense, and the derivative is continuous with respect to U. It's derivative. F prime is a continuous. So clearly, Gato implies Adamar implies C1, and that's it. By the way, the notion of Gato is so weak that it's not even implied that the function is continuous. Now, here is a theorem of mine, a local suggestion theorem. So here it is. Assume that a function f is Gato differentiable. I remind you that the classical theorem assumes that f is C1. So I'm not assuming. Assume that f is G differentiable. I forgot to say that f has to be continuous as well. 
f of 0 equals 0 and assume the following situation you have x you have y you have 0 here you have 0 here you have f f of 0 equals 0 that's just a normalization here you have a ball this ball has radius r and on this ball there is an inverse to f on this ball you have shall we say norm of f prime to the minus 1 less than some constant m then the image of f the image of the ball covers a ball of radius r over m. So it's a nice theorem because it is quantitative. You're supposed here, you know this, if you know f, you are able to compute m. And then you're saying the image of this ball has to cover a ball of radius r over m. Here is an example. I leave you. If you look at this function on the line, think of k and m as squares, as large, then the image of the interval minus 1, 1 contains the interval minus 1 over m, 1 over m, and you'll notice that k plays no role. Fine. So here's an inverse function theorem. How does it compare with the classical inverse function theorem that everyone is using, particularly those who do KM? Well, the inverse function theorem, the classical one, requires f to be c1. And do you have estimates? Yes, you have estimates. Where are they? Well, the estimates we have is called the newton kantorovich theorem. And you will find them, for instance, in the book by Charlet. called Nonlinear Functional Analysis, which is an excellent book. And this theorem tells you that it gives you estimates, and it tells you that the image of the ball of radius, it tells you something different. You find r over m and r, but you have something worse. So if you apply this theorem to the function I had before, you find, instead of finding minus 1 over m, 1 over m, you find, apply the same function, minus 1 over m to k squared, 1 over m k squared. And when k is large, this is a very significant difference, especially where you have a k squared here. So the estimates are, for the classical inverse function theorem, are very bad. And when you do km or things of that kind, these are the estimates you use. Now, perhaps you tell me, just improve these estimates. Yeah, but let me show you where it comes from. How do you prove the classical inverse function theorem? You find a convergent sequence. This is the way it's done. You try to construct a sequence that converges to the solution. And usually you do that by applying a scheme like that to the Newton scheme. Any other scheme will be the same. Now, if you work a little bit on this to show that such a scheme converges, you have to estimate xn plus 1 minus xn, and you end up with something like that, which on the one hand is very good because it is what you've been taught, quadratic convergence. This guy converges very fast because you have a square. So it's not linear convergence. You have a square here. So it starts converging. It converges much faster 
than geometric convergence. But it has a drawback. You see, this is the fast converge of Newton's method. But this guy can also be written xn plus 1 minus xn less than xn plus 1 half of mk xn plus 1 minus xn multiplied by xn plus 1 minus xn. So this guy has to be less than 1. Otherwise, there's no need that he converges. And therefore, you need this In other words, the bad estimates in the classical inverse function theorem come from the fact that you want sequences to converge. In particular, this implies uniqueness, where you get uniqueness from. And this happens only when you get close to the boundary, close to the In the earlier theorem, I do not have uniqueness, and I do not construct a convergent sequence. And the comparison is very clear, as you see. Here, for this function, in the one case, I have, my conver I have a solution of f of x equals y in the interval minus 1 m m. And in the second, I have existence for a very much smaller right-hand side. OK. So, now let me prove this theorem to you. The, look, now, in France, we used to say that, uh, that took, uh, uh, you have several kinds of people, foxes and, ch and cats. You know, the fox knows many tricks. The cat knows only one trick. He climbs up a tree. But usually, that's good enough. So I'm like the cat. I know one trick, and that is a variational principle, which is here, and which Jairo alluded to. And let me explain to it in, yeah, I think that is good enough. Ah. So the theorem will say the following. You take a function f on a complete metric space, and you assume that f is positive. You start from any point x0. You give yourself a point x0 and a number r. So you give yourself x0 and r. So you are given x naught and r. Then find some x bar such that, so you see what I do. I drive, I drove here a cone with height x naught, f of x naught. You see it here and width r. It's just a cone. Height f of x naught, width r. And I turn the cone. And then I go down. You see the cone intersects this set. And I go down as far as I can. And when I can no longer get down, further down, I get a point x bar where the translate of the cone is under the function. That's it. You pull the whole thing down. You get the cone until you get to a point here where the cone touches the function just at one point. And then you have found a wonderful point x bar with several properties. 
it should take, first of all, uh, for any other point x, this uh, with the property that the cone is under the function. What does it mean? It means that if you take a point x here, then this point, which has equation f of x bar minus f of x naught over r x minus x bar, so this is this point, is under this point. So the equation which is here, uh, it should, uh, expresses only the fact that this point is under this point. That's all it expresses. And you see other properties also. You see that x bar, you see, let me write them down. It's going to be useful. You see that find x bar with the following properties. Norm of x naught minus x bar is less than r. You find that f of x is less than f of x naught and f of x is bigger than f of x bar minus f of x naught over r norm of x minus x bar. Why this here? Because the cone is like that. This is f of x naught, and this is r. So it's just the tan of the alpha. This is alpha, and f of x naught over r is tan alpha. So this is the variation principle. A very nice picture. And it's expressed here, so except it holds for any complete metric space, no compactness required, and otherwise you get that. Fine. Now, I have to prove an inverse function theorem. I have to prove this one. So again, so I have a map f, which sends 0 to 0. This is r. Here I have norm of f of a prime of x uh, minus 1 is less than m. And uh, here, I have a ball of radius r over m, and I have this. So I have to prove this theorem. So how do I do it? So the proof is two, is two slides. One, two. Well, the proof is two slides. It consists of saying Take a point y and take a point y. And if you have and look at the function f of x equals norm of f of x minus y. So in other words, I pick a point x here f of x here, and I look at this distance. Perhaps I am, perhaps I should give you the idea of the proof first, but uh, it may be too complicated. So anyway, so I look at this. So what is it? Well, it's certainly a map from x to r. It is certainly positive bounded from below. And it's certainly continuous. Fine. So I can apply Eklund's variational principle. Now, in Eklund's principle, you had to pick two points. I had to pick x naught and r. 
it's not an R. I mean, it was little R here. Well, for x naught, I pick 0. And for little r, I pick m norm of y. That's my right. So what do I find? Well, I find that f of x is less than f of x naught, which is norm of y. This I don't care. I find x bar is less than my bar. So, so I find x bar is less than my bar. Yeah, so this becomes norm of x bar less than my bar. M -Y. Well, but if y bar is less than r over m, which was my assumption. I'm not saying that every y is covered, only those which are less than r over m. Then this is less than r, since norm of y is less than r over m. And this is interesting, because the point x bar I have found lies inside here. So it satisfies the assumption. It is inside my ball. And then, all I have to do is to use this. So let me re rewrite it. f of x, which is this, is less than f of x bar. I found x bar. f of x naught, what was f of x naught? Well, f of x naught is y bar. And r is, and little r is m, so I get here 1 over m. x minus x bar. So this is what it becomes. And then I set x equals x bar plus t u, and let t go to 0. You know? Going back to the financial principle, I have a cone which is lying under the function. But that means that the tangent at this point has to lie above the cone as well. So it gives me first order information, which now I'm seeking. And this concludes the proof, because what you get is this expression, minus 1 over f. You see? You divide by t, you let u go to 0. So you get this. And you have to compute this, letting t go to 0. Now, first remark, I'm differentiating along a straight line. I'm not differentiating. All I use is derivative along a straight line. So gato differentiability is enough. u is fixed. And then I have to differentiate this guy. So what is this guy? Here is f of x. It's the norm of something. This guy is differentiable. So you just compute the differential of a composed function. And you get the differential of capital F, which is df of x at u bar, times the derivative of the norm. But the derivative of the norm is a unit vector. So that's a unit vector. So that's the derivative of this expression. And I get this. So first remark, I can change. Uh, first, OK. First remark, I can OK. Now what I have to do now is to be smart and to choose u in a certain way. And I choose u in this way to give you an idea. What I do, so if x bar is here, I choose u. I'm going to move so, so that the thing gets closer. I'm going to move, I want the thing to move closer in that direction. And this is possible by applying L. So I choose u appropriately. 
I substitute, and be by the definition of L, df of x uh, definition of L, df of x bar u, this term is just minus f x bar y. So I get twice this, and I get this, f of x bar minus y. This becomes that. Less than 1 over m. Why less when you have plus here? Because you can change u to negative u. And then change the sign. Is less than this. But L of x bar over m, that's less than 1. So you've proved that f of x bar minus y bar is less by the itself, which is a contradiction. So there's a mistake somewhere. Where's the mistake? I've proved, I give, I've proved that 1 is less than 1. Clearly, something is wrong. What's wrong? All the computations are correct. Well, what is wrong is that, excuse me, what is wrong is this is correct as long as this is non zero. Right? Conclusion f of x bar equals y bar. Finish the story. OK. So this is the theorem. Now I'm short of time. No, I'm not short of time. Let me describe two consequences. Now I'm in the Jugendtraum. Well, first of all, a nice question. Do you have a right inverse? Under these assumptions, no. But if you make, sorry, but if you make some further, sorry again, <laughs> if you make some further assumption, notably Adamar differentiability, then you can prove that there is a right inverse which is continuous. And then lift it. But you need something more. <coughs> Joint work with Eric Seri. And now two applications. First of, all, first of all, the Morse lemma. So what does the Morse lemma say? The Morse lemma you know, there's a classification of critical points of real functions. Very interesting topic. I find that it's a bit neglected nowadays. But the first one is, if you have a non-degenerate critical point, meaning, so a critical point means f and f prime vanish. It's flat. And here, the second derivative is non-degenerate. Then you can perform a change of variable so that after the change of variable is done, the function is exactly equal to AXX. So you see, if you set phi is a change of variable, if you set phi of x equals y, then you get that f is exactly one half of AYY. You can forget the other terms. Very beautiful theorem. Very important in differential geometry, the basis of Morse theorem and so on. I, it's fair to say that Morse proved a C infinity case, and the first one to approve it in the C2 case was, a, uh, was an Italian mathematician named Cambini. Otherwise, and you, uh, his proof is still not, his proof is very nice, and if you look in the books, you will see that usually proved in C3. But Cambini proved it in C2. But unfortunately, C2 is not good enough. Because, as far as I'm concerned, there are no C2 functions around. There are none. Why? Because I work in the calculus of variations. In the calculus of variations, you deal with the integrals of that kind. Now, suppose f is very small, and you tell me, well, this is obviously going to be C2 in L2. No. <coughs> Why? Well, assume f is very nice. C infinity, bounded, analytic, you name it. Then differentiate, and you're going to get something like that. F double prime of u v v is this guy. Not very difficult. You just apply the dominated convergence theorem. You work nice. And you say, show the C2. No. Common mistake. You know, each time I have a work to look on in, in, in more sur Hamilton system, look it up, and the guy makes a mistake. It was first pointed out by a Russian mathematician, and Smale made a paper about it. No, it is not C2. Why? Because, you see, to be C2, you need the map U gives F double drop of U 
to be continuous. So U is in L2. Where is F double dot? Well, V is in L2. V is in L2. This guy is in L2. This guy is in L2. So this guy has to be in L infinity. So you're asking from this map to be continuous from L2 to L infinity. And there is no way to transform pointwise conversion to uniform convergence. So this is never C2, except if it is constant, of course. So it is, these such maps are not C2 unless they're exactly quadratic. And this is why, in differential geometry, if you look up Morse, you find always broken geodesics. When people want to do Morse theory in loop spaces, they do broken geodesics because they cannot work directly in the L2 space. And I myself, when I wrote my big paper on Morse theory for uh, convex Hamiltonian systems, I did Morse theory, but I had to resort to broken geodesics also to find a dimensional reduction. I wished, I wish we had a more, it's tedious, we had a Morse theory for not C2 functions. And now, Jugend Kram, I have it. So now let me mention that the same result holds if the function is gato C2. That means the restriction to every straight line is C2. And this is the case in the calculus of variations. So now, good news, you can do Morse theory without broken geodesics because of that. OK. Idea of proof, yes, I'll skip with the idea of proof. And now the last part. We're getting closer to uh, the last part. We're getting closer to Arnold. Frische spaces, <coughs> or nash moser without quadratic terms. Well, what is the problem now? Well, I'm very sorry, not sorry, but I realize uh, I'm, that I'm impa, and people at impa are very familiar with that. So. But I have to explain it nevertheless. So this is very classical. This is the problem of small divisors. So if you know it, you can go to sleep. If you don't know it, it's very interesting. You can listen. So here is a small divisors problem. So the problem of small divisors is the following. You work on the torus, meaning that, or if you prepare a periodic function, me, work in the torus means that, uh, oh, shh. Excuse me. So please uh, let us correct that and write u equals sum of u n exponential n1 theta 1 plus n2 yeah fine so work on this torus s1 cos s1 so i'm sorry my I did something wrong and then on this torus, so don't look at that, look at that. And on this torus, I look at a differential operator of that kind. So the torus is that. And you're looking at something like that. And since the angle omega 1 over omega 2 is irrational, the thing never closes. 
So this is a differential operator. And you want to invert it. So it's a differential operator, so call it d omega, and it loses one derivative, and d omega sends, uh, shall we say, hk into hk minus 1. It loses one derivative. So what about the omega minus 1? Well, to look at the omega minus 1 is very simple. You look at Fourier, sorry, you look at Fourier coefficients. You, you look at that, and you look at the omega of u equals f, and you end with something which is going to be un equals fn uh, divided by, uh, uh, poof, I am sure I missed, uh, I mixed uh, things uh, up. Uh, yes, fn divided by omega 1 n1 plus omega 2 n2, up to mistakes, which you will forgive me. And because omega 1 over omega 2 is irrational, this thing never vanishes, but it can be very small. It's a small divisor. In fact, you throw in an approximation. You assume that omega 1 to omega 2 is poorly approximated by rational in that sense. Alpha has to be positive, and there are infinitely many, and uh, there's a full measure of things of that kind. And you end up with something like the following. You end up with un being less than some fn times something times, uh, times n1 plus alpha. So un is worse than fn. It is worse. The coefficient, if you want to solve Laplacian u, if you want to solve d omega u equals f, you do that, then you find that u is worse than f. It has less derivatives because the coefficient is increased. And so it turns out that d omega minus 1 exists. There's no problem about that. But it sends hk minus 1 into h k minus 2 minus alpha. And so you cannot apply the classical inverse function theorem because the inverse exists but does not send you back where you started from. So this is a classical problem. There is an inverse, no doubt about it. You can compute it, but it does not send you back to the space you started from. So you cannot apply the usual inverse function theorem. So the first ones to study such theorems. So you have to work in another setting. You have maps that lose derivatives and their inverse lose derivative as well. So the adapted setting consists of looking at settings like that, sequences of spaces. Think of C infinity that is composed of C1, C2, the smaller space or subtler spaces. And in these spaces, you have Fourier subspaces. So you have a sequence of spaces. And you construct a solution, usually. You construct a solution. You solve the, you want to solve. You have a function f from c infinity to c infinity, such that f of 0 equals 0. And you want to solve f of u equals v or something like that. So well, how do you do it? Now the proofs are standard. What you do is you look at the restriction to finite dimensional subspaces, and you construct a sequence xn. And these sequences have the following properties. There is a high norm where it diverges. This becomes very large. And a small norm where it converges. This is very small. So you have two norms. You have the excess. So in a 
this. In C0 norm, it converts very fast. In C10,000 norms, it diverges very highly. But by interpolation, you can find a place where it converges nicely. Never mind. So I will skip you. And just to point out, at every step, you apply the inverse function theorem. And this is why the inverse function theorem comes in. These are proofs. I tried hard to find a direct proof without constructing sequences. I could not. But so I use the standard proofs. You apply at each stage the inverse function theorem. But now I have a larger range. Already now, it's better. So you have estimates. And it proves, you can prove existence. Now, perhaps a specialist in the audience, so let me point out something for people who know this theory. You need estimates on the function itself and its derivative, right? And these are so-called Cauchy estimates. Either you work in CS or you work in the space of analytic functions in a band. And these are Cauchy estimates. And this, you see, says, you see the norm of f prime in S. You have m prime uh, m. They lose derivatives. You see? They lose derivatives. These are the loss of derivatives. And L also loses derivatives. These maps lose derivatives. And these are my assumptions. Now, if you look up all other works, and here's your theorem, which I skip. And if you look all other works, for instance, if you look the work by Hermander, which is certainly the better one, you find that people use, need this and this, and they also need an estimate on the second derivative. They need a Cauchy estimate on the second derivative. Because why? <laughs> because they have to estimate the range. And this is usually the hard part. We don't need quadratic terms in our proof. This is joint work with Rick Seri. So we don't need quadratic terms, and we have larger range. Of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Can you get better results? Well, let's try something. So here is a problem where you do get better results. It's a recent paper by Texier and Zumbre, which worry about coupled Schrodinger equations. So you have here coupled these are Schrodinger equations, a system, and it's nonlinear. And it's de dealt with by linear perturbation with some estimates here. And you're looking at an initial condition problem. So here is the initial condition. And the initial condition is of this kind. So you know, either oscillations and concentrations. So let me just point out that we get better results than Texier Zambrin. Here, for instance, for existence, Texier Zambrin requires a dimension p be bigger than 4, and we get p bigger, less than 3, and so on. And uh, we we get better results in two dimensions and in three dimensions. So that uh, we do think this has a lot of uh, power. So next time, God willing, KM, and meanwhile, obrigado. Thank you.